Hey there, welcome back to AeroSafe, your go-to channel for aviation weather and decision making. Today is Sunday, June 2nd. It's about 11 a.m. or uh, 1500 Zulu. So we'll be looking today like we normally do at a weather analysis across the country from the perspective of general aviation pilots. For most of us, that means we're flying light piston aircraft, not certified for flight into known icing. And we've got limitations in terms of how far above the weather we can go, which we can't. In this weather analysis, we're gonna break down the areas of VFR weather and the areas of IFR weather. Then we'll talk a little bit about the potential hazards that exist within both of those areas. We'll be using the AeroSafe Weather Brief Checklist, which is available to you for free at gilbertaviation.com slash AeroSafe. This Weather Brief Checklist takes you through all of the pre-flight action items that are required in order to prepare for a flight. And then from there, we walk through all of the weather reports and forecasts that you would need to look at to get a full picture and understand the environment that you're about to operate in. I'll be using 1-800-WEATHERBRIEF.COM to walk through this weather briefing. We're going to start with the weather charts and we'll begin by looking at the surface analysis. The surface analysis gives us an idea of where all of the pressure and frontal systems exist across the United States. So we've got a lot going on today. Mostly high pressure exists along the East Coast. The big story today is going to be this stuff that's going on over Oklahoma, Kansas, and Nebraska. We've got a trough and a dry line here that are really kind of creating this weather that's going on. Behind the dry line, we see a mix of pressure systems over the four corners, some high and lows. Uh, we see a low pressure system over Idaho and another over Washington. So these pressure and frontal systems are gonna create a lot of the weather that we are about to look at. Okay, first thing that I wanna do is just kind of at a glance, look at the METARs and the flight category across the US. Eastern part of the US today, we've got a lot of marginal VFR and IFR conditions. There was also some precipitation that kind of moved out earlier today. Here in Lynchburg, Virginia, it's green, which means it's reporting VFR. However, it's filled in, which means that there is a ceiling. Here's a check ride question. Here in Lynchburg, Virginia, what is the lowest ceiling? The lowest ceiling here in Lynchburg is the overcast layer at 11,000. A ceiling is only what is reported as broken or overcast. Anything less than that is not a ceiling. And so technically speaking, a, an airport could be reporting VFR with a few layer at 300 feet. So it does look like conditions here in Lynchburg are going to deteriorate. Ceilings are gonna come down and we'll get some uh, showers in the vicinity. And then eventually the ceiling will come down, they're predicting all the way to 2,500 feet. I wanna take a second to look in Illinois here. Let's see, Springfield at one zero two zero at seven, 10 miles of visibility and overcast at 1,300 feet. Most um, approaches with vertical guidance are gonna take us down to two or 300 feet. And so you've got a lot of room there. You've got a thousand feet of room to come out of the ceiling, come out of the clouds, and then continue on the visual portion of your approach. These conditions here are ideal for building instrument currency and proficiency. Where I would not do it would be on the leading edge of this system. On the leading edge of this, even though it looks somewhat similar, it might look even better if you just take this one METAR from 24 minutes ago and compare it to that in Illinois. What's important is the trend, and we know that in these mid-range latitudes here in the U.S., our weather comes from the west. So here in West Virginia, you could look westerly and see, you know, all the way from the northwest to the southwest, none of that looks better. It's all going to be trending worse before it gets better. These back ends of the weather systems like this are a really great chance and opportunity to get some actual instrument flying in. There's a lot of VFR weather in this corridor from Minnesota down to Louisiana. However, it's the same consideration that we need to take. We've got this line of thunderstorms and convective activity coming in. Depending on where you're going and what you're doing, that could be a potentially dangerous situation that you might want to stay out of. Some of the best weather that I'm seeing is on the back end of these systems, in the Four Corners area, up into Montana, even into Nevada and parts of Oregon. Up in Washington, there is some precipitation, some marginal VFR, IFR, and low IFR, and then we see some ceilings along the coast of California as well. 
I'm assuming that's going to be uh, what we refer to as the marine layer. So generally speaking today, we've got a little area of IFR up on the western coast of Washington. We've got IFR conditions along that storm that is stretching from, you know, interestingly enough, actually, there's not a whole lot of IFR flight category going on here, mostly because these ceilings are pretty high, but that doesn't mean that it's safe to fly in. Hastings here, so a lot going on, very strong wind. So this is VFR, thunderstorms in the vicinity, rain, few at 6,000, few at 8,000. So it's VFR because we've got 10 miles of visibility, but the highest ceiling is 10,000 feet, even though our peak wind is uh, 39 knots and there's lightning in the distance. So that is um, VFR, but not. And we also have IFR weather along the Gulf Coast and in the uh, central eastern part of the U.S. Idaho and Montana all the way down to the Mexican border is going to be really nice. You'll just have to make sure that, you know, winds are within your limits, no wind shear or anything like that. Florida and the far east coast, but the danger there is that the trend and the weather is going to be moving your way. So you want to be mindful of that. We're going to look now at SIGMETs and AIRMETs. So each little white box is a convective SIGMET, which covers all of that area we were talking about earlier. You don't want to be flying in it at all, especially as a VFR pilot, because with that convective stuff, you never know what's going to happen. This convective segment over um, Oklahoma and Texas looks particularly rough. Embedded thunderstorms moving from the west at 15 knots, tops above flight level 450. That is really tall. Hail up to an inch and a quarter, wind gusts to 50 knots possible. This one is caused by that dry line we were looking at earlier. And the dry line is the boundary between the hot dry air from the desert and the hot moist air from the Gulf. Those two colliding creates some really rough weather as we see right now. We also see some convective segments over in the Gulf region. Uh, some convective segments along Florida, one over Atlanta, that sucks. That always causes problems, doesn't it? Diminishing area of embedded thunderstorms. So at least we've got that. Based on these segments and convective outlooks, I'd stay out of this line of storms here in the heart of the country, stay out of the Mississippi Delta there too, and probably away from Atlanta, which I would stay away from Atlanta anyway, but I grew up there, I can say that. We're gonna look at the AirMet Tangos first. AirMet Tangos are primarily for turbulence, T for turbulence. They also indicate low level wind shear and sustained surface winds of 30 knots or greater. The green ones are all high level turbulence, so flight level 180 or higher. And while those aren't necessarily pertinent to us, they do give you an overall indication of the stability of the atmosphere. Up here in the far northwest, we've got low level wind shear and low level turbulence. And sustained surface winds off the coast of Oregon greater than 30 knots. That's really yucky stuff up there when we get into low level turbulence and low level wind shear and sustained surface winds of greater than 30 knots. Um, that's kind of all just the, you know, lining up to say, probably not a good idea. Down here in South California as well, we also have low level turbulence. Those are hazards in, in those areas. Let's look now at the AirMet Sierras. These are for IFR conditions, meaning you cannot see. We've got mountain obscuration in the far northwest and along the coast of California, which is to be expected. Even though we see mostly VFR categorical reports there, we do know that there is some terrain, some elevation. They start issuing air mets when the affected area is 3,000 square miles or greater. When it comes to an area that large, we have to think as piston pilots, is this an area where I can reasonably find an out if conditions deteriorate or, um, if I have an emergency and I just need to. We also have an AirMet Sierra over Texas and Louisiana, which we already know we aren't gonna be flying in those areas anyway because of the convective activity. Now this big area of what we called IFR weather earlier is also supported by the AirMets here, both mountain obscuration over the Appalachians and the AirMet Sierras over really that whole region. Now all of those areas that are IFR, they also have some associated AirMet Zulus. Z is for freezing. The Northeast um, is an AirMet Zulu, moderate ice between the freezing level and flight level 240. The freezing level begins at 11,000. 
as pilots of light piston aircraft, most of us do not have certification for flight into known icing conditions. We have no structural anti or de-icing equipment. We know that we can reasonably expect icing to occur where the temperature is at or around freezing and there's visible moisture. So from there, you have to think, can I remain safely below the freezing level and above the terrain? Safely below the freezing level is gonna be three or 4,000 feet below it, assuming you do not have certification for flight into known icing. So this would be an area where, you know, I would start to question, you know, number one, are you instrument current and proficient? Number two, can you stay below the freezing level and above the terrain and altitude? And then further, are there other hazards in that area? Which we already saw, there's no um, sigmets there. And there's also no wind shear or turbulence or anything like that. In the Northwest here, we see some other icing air mets, moderate ice between the freezing level and flight level 240 and the freezing level 8,000 to 13,000. Same thing. If I'm in a cloud, can I remain below the freezing level and above the terrain and elevation safely? Okay, we've looked at surface analysis, sigmets, air mets. Let's look at pie reps now. We have pie reps in a lot of the areas that we've already talked about, which tends to support some of the decisions we may have already made. For instance, along this stretch of storms in the middle of the country, we do see reports of turbulence. This one here, uh, 747, light to moderate turbulence. Now I can tell you for sure, if a 747 says there is light to moderate turbulence, that's gonna be like severe for us and our 172s and Pipers and um, Cirruses and all of that. Uh, but we also aren't flying at flight level 350. There are a lot of pyreps in this area that are reporting sky conditions, so cloud tops and bases. If the ceiling is low enough, you may get a request from ATC to report those tops and bases as you're flying through them. In the real world, if you were doing a flight, you would definitely want to look at all of the pyreps along your route of flight and try and discern which ones are most applicable to you and how you might mitigate any hazards associated with those pyreps. Icing pyreps are obviously huge. If you're getting reporting of icing, you know, down at the levels where we normally fly, that would be no go. Pyreps are, are really important because they give us the, the only actual real life indications of what's going on in the, in the environment. Have you ever made a pyrep in flight? Not just to ATC, but have you ever called up flight service while you were in flight to give a pyrep? If so, let me know below. I'd love to hear about the conditions that were um, present and why you decided to make a pyrep. Let's look now at cloud coverage. So to access that, we'll go to weather charts. We'll come down to the bottom right. This is only a forecast, so we can only look into the future. We'll choose three hours. This supports everything that we've talked about. We see low ceilings that were supported by those categorical reports of uh, marginal VFR and IFR, even some low IFR, in all those areas that we talked about. We also see um, tops in my part of the world. There, it's clear above. Look, we've got tops at 7,000, 4,500, 5,000. This is a situation that further supports what I was talking about earlier with going out and getting some instrument currency. The cloud coverage chart is a really great way to help determine Am I flying into lower ceilings? Am I flying into higher ceilings? Am I going to be able to get above the clouds? Where are the tops? Again, important to remember that this is a forecast, not observations. So what they forecast might not be exactly right. We can't hang our hat on this, but it is additional information to help us make decisions. Alrighty, we already briefly talked about the freezing level. It's not gonna be a concern for most of us. Winds aloft. You would definitely wanna check out your winds aloft. Looks like we don't have any up-to-date wind data right now, but you would wanna look at your winds aloft to determine if you're gonna have a tailwind or a headwind. Along with that, you'll be able to determine your ground speed, and then based on your fuel burn as determined in your POH performance charts, you'll know, am I gonna be able to make it to my destination? Do I need to stop for fuel? And even outside of that, you know, if you've got a 40 knot wind off your nose, can you physiologically make it to your destination? Winds aloft are incredibly important for you to know and understand for your fuel planning and flight planning. Aviation surface forecast. I know I've said this before, but I've been seeing this chart pop up a lot on check rides, mostly because with electronic flight bags, the examiner can ask you about any products within your electronic flight bag. 
This chart depicts exactly what it sounds like. We get surface visibility as depicted by these shaded regions. And these shaded regions correlate to the flight category that we see with our stations. We also see our wind barbs. So for example, here in Colorado, we see the wind is from the west at this one depiction, 10 knots gusting to 25. We also see some of our air mats. We see IFR air mat. There's also an air mat tango for that high surface wind there on the west coast. This chart also tells us about certain weather that may exist. So for example, all these little red indications with the arrows depict thunderstorms. The severity of the thunderstorm and the coverage of the thunderstorm is also indicated by the color. So the light red says there's a chance for isolated thunderstorms, 20, 10 to 20% sky coverage. The dark red indicate potential for numerous thunderstorms, so 60 to 100% coverage. We also have these green triangles and the green dots, those depict rain. I would encourage you to look at the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's legend for all of these depictions and what exactly they mean. So here's a check guide question. What do these three dashed lines mean? What does that icon represent? Well, if we come down here, we can see that a yellow icon is going to indicate fog. And if we back that up with the imagery legend from NOAA, we would also know that those three dashed lines indicate fog. So if we use the AeroSafe Weather Brief Checklist, we've looked at the surface analysis chart. We've looked at SIGMETs, AIRMETs, PIREPs. We've looked at cloud coverage, freezing level. We've talked about winds aloft we didn't have access to. Um, if you were to do an actual flight planning brief, you'd have access to the winds aloft there relative to your actual route of flight. We looked at the aviation surface forecast, METARs and TAFs. And then the last thing you'd want to do if you were actually doing a weather briefing is you'd want to call a weather briefer. This gives you the chance and opportunity to talk to somebody who deals with the weather every day, and in particular, who deals with weather in relation to aviation decision-making, aeronautical decision-making. They are there as a resource, a, a tax-funded resource to talk to and ask questions. See if there's any holes in the knowledge from the briefing that you got earlier and make sure that there's no hazards that you may have missed in your briefing. I highly advocate to all of my students to call a weather briefer because it gives an enhanced understanding of the environment that you're gonna be operating in. I wanna thank you so much for tuning in to AeroSafe today. Every view, share, and subscription is incredibly valued. Every time you tune in, you are directly contributing to aviation safety by increasing your weather knowledge and understanding and weather-related decision-making. If you're interested in how you could further support the channel, you can check out patreon.com slash aerosafe. If you become a patron, you open the door to exclusive access to additional online content. Patrons get access to longer, less edited videos. You get to see things slowed down to actually see me navigate through the website. Patrons also get access to monthly live stream where we can connect and chat. You can bring up any questions that you may have from experiences that you've had or through your flight training. Again, I wanna thank you so much for logging in today and watching this video, spending a little time with me talking about the weather and aviation. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much, have fun, fly safe.